So the, the first topic is alarms, and I had the alarms project opened up here to get ready for that. So we can see here that we have this alarms widget, which I'm going to be looking at. There's actually a couple of them. And we can use that to display either our active alarms or um, historical alarms, which we have here. As well. So I'm just going to go ahead and show how we set up the alarms, and then we'll use the alarms widgets. So first, you can find alarms on the left-hand side. These are where our um, advanced widgets, as I call them, are. We see reports, trends, scheduler. Those are all here as well. So those are all things that um, we'll be looking at are mostly here on the left side. So if I double click on alarms, I'm able to get into my alarms editor. You can see we can have uh, a very large number of alarms. It's also possible to import them and export them. Uh, they would be exported to an XML file, and that's the type of file we'd, we'd be looking to import them from as well. So this is a good way that you can export your alarms from one project and then add them uh, to another one. To create a new alarm, we just click this plus sign, and we have now our first alarm. We can give it a name if we want to. Um, we can put them in groups. Um, but really, the important things that we're going to be paying most attention to for the alarms here are the trigger, uh, the tag, and the action. Just a little bit to the right. So first, I'm going to click in the cell under trigger and click the square here. This is how we can edit the trigger. So by default, it just gave us a bit mask alarm. What a bit mask alarm does is it will throw the alarm whenever the bit at this position is um, a one value. So in this case, it just picked my Boolean tag which means there's only only one bit that we could be choosing from. So whenever my tag Boolean 1 uh, gets flipped to a 1, the alarm would be triggered. Um, I will explain the rest of these types after, but I just want to go through and um, completely explain the behavior of one alarm first. So whenever my trigger is thrown, uh, the value of tag 1 is a 1. Some action will be executed. So that is this cell here, action. And we can add the action by clicking on this square here and select from um, our action list, which is similar to the action list that you would have seen um, with a button or, or any other way that you would add an action. It's just a little bit smaller, but most of them are still here. Um, we can do things like Set a tag, which I think would be common in this case. Um, another very common one is to show a dialog or to uh, lo load a page or change the page. Also, you can launch JavaScript. You can send an email, which is common as well. Um, send some kind of an email telling the, the administrator or the operator that um, an alarm has been thrown. So to just go back to types of alarms, which again were under trigger. Uh, we had bit mask alarm, which was the one I was looking at. If the tag that I chose was not a Boolean, let's say for example it was a short, which is 16 bits in JMobile, then um, I could put a, a num another number here, like a three or a four, and then it would be listening for the, the third or the fourth bit here instead of uh, the zero with bit. So if that third bit became a one, then the alarm would be from. Um, the actual first type of alarm here is a limit alarm. This is an alarm that will be thrown if my tag um, goes outside of the boundaries set here. So this is not really useful for a, a Boolean tag, but if, if this was selected to be a, a short or an integer or something else, then um, we could be using this type of alarm. And just like with any other properties or, or actions in JMobile, if you see these plus signs here, then you are able to link a tag to it. So your alarm can actually be triggered off of a varying tag or varying value by using a tag. The third one is a deviation alarm. This just allows us to choose a set point and throw the alarm if our tag goes beyond the set deviation. 
And the last one is a value alarm. This allows us to throw alarm, throw an alarm if um, our tag hits whatever this value is set to be. And again, these can be set to tag. So I'm just going to go ahead and set a value alarm. And this alarm can be set for its value of my tag short one. The tag that I want to be using is tag two. So what will happen here is that whenever tag two or short two um, hits my designated value, which is the value of short one, there will be an alarm that is thrown. So for my alarm, I want to have some kind of action that is executed when this happens. Um, for that action, I'm just going to show a dialog, uh, which means I need to create a dialog real quick. That one's fine. So my dialog that I can have here um, that I want to show, I just need to click this square under action. Find page, which is what a dialog is considered and is how we can add a dialog. So I can click show dialog and select my dialog. So real quick on my page here, I'm just going to add a couple numeric fields for short two and short one, and I'll make them read write. So whenever these values become the same is when uh, my alarm will be thrown. which it is thrown at the beginning because they both started at zero. So if I set them to be the same thing again, we can see that my alarm is thrown. So that's just a, a basic showing of how we actually set these alarms up. Um, the next thing that we want to do here is show those alarm table widgets which are how we can actually see which, which alarms are being thrown and uh, record it. So in the widget gallery, if we find under basic, again, through the widget gallery, just as a quick review, um, we have our categories and our subcategories. So basic is a category. I can click just the first subcategory, which is text numeric, to change the subcategory and find alarms. So there's a few alarm tables here. You might have more or less depending on your version of JMobile, but a lot of them are almost the exact same thing. So we can take um, something like the active alarms widget, drag and drop it onto the screen. Um, make it larger if we need to show all the columns. And what we'll be able to do this, with this is just um, see which alarms are currently triggered, we can save those into an XML or a CSV file. And we can also acknowledge or, or turn off any alarms using this widget as well. So this is a great thing to use just on some kind of an administrator only settings page um, where you can show you know, what alarms are currently active and have uh, a protective, protected page that only some users can see. And during the user management section, which is in module three, um, I will show how to make that type of page. So some another good thing to go on that page might be the alarms history widget, um, which is very similar. It's just going to record um, more of a log of all alarms that have been thrown, not just the ones that are currently active. So those are things that um, will be easier for me to show using the example project. Um, since there are a few alarms set up there already. Um, something that people do ask a lot is how to customize this widget. Uh, the alarms widget and a lot of the widgets that we're going to be looking at here are actually groups of other widgets. So if you right click it, you'll see that we have convert to group. If you remember from last time, um, we showed how to group widgets together and turn them into a custom widget. That's basically what this is. It's a, a group of widgets together that were turned into a custom widget. So if I click convert to group, my custom widget um, is no longer a custom widget. It's just a group of widgets. And um, if I decide to ungroup this, 
then it's it's really easy to to pull this apart and start moving things around. Another way to do that is actually by leaving it as a custom widget. So in this case, you can see that I am still a custom widget. And I can just click on a certain element three times. So click, click, click. Sometimes it's it's four depending on what you clicked on first. But if I click this button three times, now I have uh, control over it. So I can delete it if I want to. Um, I could add additional buttons. I could change the color. So you actually have a, a pretty high level of control with what you can do here. You can change the text as well. Um, also, if we look in our properties on the right side here and expand all of them, you'll see that you can edit a lot of things here too. Um, it, is poss it is possible to change the columns. You can change what they're sorted by. You can actually change which columns are being shown. So if I decide um, I don't want the state column, I can get rid of it. And I, I can get rid of as many columns as I want and kind of minimize um, what kind of table we have. So switching from here to the alarms example project, I'm just going to simulate this again. So you can see that we have four sliders here that are being used to trigger four different alarms. If I click on the question marks, I, I can see what the alarms are. So the first one is a bitmask alarm um, attached to tag one. So whenever the value of tag one, which it looks like is a Boolean, becomes a one, the alarm will be triggered. So we can see that the, the trigger or the alarm has been triggered here. Um, tag two is a limit alarm. So if the alarms, if the value of tag two goes outside the boundaries of this limit, beyond zero to 75, then the alarm will be thrown. So in, in this case, there was an action, and the action was just showing a dialog like I set up. Uh, the third one is our deviation alarm. So if it goes um, beyond 30% of uh, our set point value here, uh, then the alarm is thrown. And our last one is a value alarm. So whenever the tag, uh, tag four, reaches that value, then the alarm is thrown. So it looks like this is the only one that was actually tied to the table. Um, but we do see our alarm here. Um, it's been triggered. So this is what it looks like when an alarm is uh, triggered with the active alarms widget. And uh, we can select these and acknowledge them and, and reset. Um, it didn't go away because the alarm is still triggered. The second page here is the historical alarms page. So during all that time I was playing with the alarms, um, you can see a list of the alarms that went off. You can change this to show um, how long it's, it's recording these for. Uh, mine is just five minutes, which is all the this stuff I was doing. Um, and of course, we can refresh this. Maybe if we have one minute, we'd start to see them go away. Um, move forward or backwards. And this button here is a dump. So I mentioned earlier that it's possible to um, record your alarms would have um, gone on or off during uh, that certain period of time and saved them to a, a CSV file. The way that we do that is by just launching some kind of an event and using this action dump event archive, which you can find under system, system dump event archive. Select the folder path um, and the events archive, which is, in this case, our alarm buffer one. Um, on the alarm page, there was a way to create multiple buffers. This example just has one buffer, but you could have multiple buffers that 
are not dumped at the same time. So that's going to be it for alarms. Um, if you do have any questions, you can post them in the chat or ask them um, in between modules. So next, I'm going to move on to the scheduler, which we find in a similar way that I found my alarms. It's just uh, two below it. So if we double click on scheduler, uh, we are able to use our scheduler, which looks pretty similar. So if I click the plus sign here, I can begin creating a new scheduled event. And if I select here the name, I can change the name. If I select the type cell, I can change the type. We have two types, um, recurring and high resolution. Recurring is exactly what you would expect. It allows you to choose uh, a time or an interval and execute an action either at that time, uh, every so often, or on an interval. The interval could be like one second. Um, so something goes off every one second or every one minute. High resolution is a little bit different. This just allows us to um, kind of do a similar thing to the first one, but faster. So this is how you could implement like a, a recurring event down to 100 milliseconds. Um, if you had some kind of script that was running every so often, you could do it like this. Um, you can kind of run basic actions on the scheduler, even with JavaScript. Um, but it's not nearly as powerful as a, a PLC clock, so that's something to keep in mind. So mostly I'm just going to be looking at the um, recurring actions here. So I've selected my type. I can now click in this schedule cell, click the circle here in the schedule cell, and we have our, our scheduler um, set up. So the type of action, um, this can be by date, we select the date for it to happen. Um, daily, this just means that it happens every day. Every, uh, this is similar to the high resolution scheduler, but um, not as fast. So I can go down to one second, one minute, one hour. Um, at every one hour, for example, this action would occur. Hourly um, just means that uh, at a certain minute every hour the action goes off so in this case 1021 1121 1221 um, the action would be would occur monthly is um, every day so July 25th September 25th um, and you can select decide the time weekly um, Mondays Tuesdays etc every Monday every Tuesday and uh, yearly so this is um, every August 25th, every every July 25th, whatever. So we have um, time mode here, which is just um, usually you want to pick standard time, but you can change the type of time um, depending on what you like to use. Condition, this would allow us to use a Boolean tag. And when the Boolean tag is true, the scheduled action will occur. If the Boolean tag is not true, the scheduled action will not occur. Um, if you do not put a condition, then the scheduled action will always occur. So I think most often uh, a condition is not used. And finally, your action. So similar to the alarm, we have our action list and the list of, of actions that we're able to execute here. So again, it can be an email, it can be JavaScript. This is uh, a great way to send your data out in an email, um, maybe at the end of the day every day. So I will just set up a, a basic schedule here, uh, one that we don't have to wait too long for something to happen. Um, maybe every, every seven seconds or so should be good. Um, I will put a condition just so we can play with this a little bit. And my action is just going to show the dialog. Uh, maybe five seconds. So I'll save, and I'm just going to put a numeric field again with tag one. 
So whenever this tag is uh, a one, my schedule will be um, active if it goes off for the first time for my alarm still. So I'll wait a little bit and we'll see that nothing is going to happen. And if I change this to a one, then we should see after about five seconds or so that that dialogue is going to show up again. And the reason it showed up the first time was because the dialogue was still be sh being shown for my alarm. I, I forgot to delete this. So the dialogue showed up the first time from the alarms, not the scheduler. There is a scheduler widget, similar to the alarms widget, which is in the widget gallery um, basic category um, scheduler right above alarms. This one is a little bit more basic, but still very useful. Um, what this allows us to do is list all of our, our schedules. And in my example project here, I, I only had one, but I'll open up the scheduler example and we can see that there will be more. And we can change almost any element of the schedule. We can change um, what, what type it is, what tag is uh, enabling it or not enabling it, um, what time of day it's going off, um, a, a lot of things we can change. Really, the only things we can't do with this scheduler widget are add a new schedule. Um, we can't delete a schedule, but we could just disable it. And also, we can't change the action. So, for example, my schedule one was changing the act, or the action was it was displaying uh, dialogue. If I wanted that to instead um, change the page or send an email, I can't do that with the scheduler widget during runtime. So that's something that needs to be edited um, at the schedule level over here. Over here. So I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, my scheduler project. So here we have the schedule widget. Um, it looks like I have three schedules here. The first one seems to be incrementing this um, every one second or so. Um, every half a second. So schedule one is a high resolution schedule activating the action step tag. So it's just raising it by one every 500 milliseconds. And um, it's important to note that high resolution schedulers do not appear in the scheduler widget um, just because it, it's not something that you would be changing. So schedule two here is toggling the bit every five seconds. So right before I click this, we saw that change from blue to red, and it just changed back. So um, that's just toggling a bit every five seconds, similar to a high resolution scheduler, but just slower. Uh, my third schedule type, toggle bit with the condition. So it's similar to the first one, but it's only going to happen if um, my tag is actually enabled. So I think now that I've clicked that, yep, we'll see it changing every five seconds. If I turn it back off, it won't change. So it's, it's basically the one that I set up already. And schedule four is showing the dialog on a time basis. It's being shown at 2 p.m. every um, Monday, Tuesday, every weekday. So we, we're not going to see this one do anything. However, um, I wanted to do something. So I can use the scheduler widget here, and um, I'll just change it to 1030. Um, uh, I missed 1030, so 1031. And um, I, I don't feel like waiting another minute for it, but if I did wait another minute for it, then we would see um, the dialog show up. So that's really all there is to it for the scheduler. It's it's a bit more basic than the alarm widget, but it's it's still pretty powerful. Um, you you can run JavaScript off of a scheduler, which which is something that some people do if, if they want to have a script that goes off every so often. So the the third part of module one here is uh, the data transfers widget. Um, we can find the data transfers widget over here on the left again. Um, 
near the other ones, double click on data transfers. What this allows us to do is take the value of one tag and store it in another tag. It's functionally almost the same thing as if we created an action that uses data transfer. Um, just to show what I mean here, I'll create a button real quick and launch the event data transfer which um, is part of tag data transfer. So it lets us select the source tag um, that can be short one and the destination tag that can be short two. So whenever I click on this button, it's going to move the value of short one into short two. So short one is a seven, and now short two is a seven. Um, so this is basically what the data transfers widget is doing, and I, I just wanted to illustrate that to um, to show that we can move move one tag value to another tag value. But what's so powerful about this is that it's going to allow us to do these um, in large quantities, and it will be listening um, and up and perform that transfer automatically. So what I mean is that if I select a tag here, short one, and um, another tag, short two. So it's the same thing as before. We have short one is going into short two. We can change the direction. It can even go both to um, make sure these are always the same. Um, the update method is on update. This just means that it's always going to be, be listening. So the difference between this and what I set up a minute ago is that the other, the one with the button was only transferring the value when I click on the button, but this one is going to transfer the value as soon as it updates. So as soon as short one changes from, from zero to seven, that seven is going to go into short two. Um, now we could use a trigger, which is looking mostly for uh, a Boolean tag, and we can use that trigger to say whenever the Boolean tag goes to one, um, that's when the transfer happens instead. But nine out of 10 times, you don't want to use trigger. You just want to have it executing all the time. So to show that real quick, I will simulate. I don't even need this button anymore. Um, make this an eight. And it went to an eight um, almost immediately. So when we talk about using the usually the EXware, but really any of our HMIs, because um, this is present in all of them, as a, a protocol gateway or a, a device for protocol conversion, this is what we would be using here. So to set that up as a quick example, um, I'm going to add the Ethernet IP protocol. And I'll just create uh, create a tag here that I can use. So my data transfer here, my second one, is going to be the Ethernet IP short that I just made. Um, you might have noticed I made it an integer as part of Ethernet IP because those integers are, are 16 bits to match our shorts. So we can have an incoming Ethernet IP tag um, and save that into, well, any of these really. So this is a way that we can execute our protocol conversion. Um, Ethernet IP to variables might not seem that useful, but we could have done Ethernet IP to, to Modbus TCP or, or Codasys to Ethernet IP, um, re really any combination here. And this is a great way to um, use the XWare to push data from one device to another. Um, this is also very useful for if you need to use um, things like OPC UA, um, have data come in and then go out using our OPC UA server if you want to convert them to a uh, a different protocol type in the process, then you can do that here too.
So really, that's that's all there is um, for data transfers. Um, there is an example project, but there's really not that much to show off of it, so I'm not going to, to bother opening that one up. Um, this is it for module one. I'm, I'm almost a third of the way through. I'll take a, a few minute break here for questions. Um, and then after the questions, we can just wait a moment. So it looks like DDA mo answered most of the questions already. Um, one that just came in was, can you do math on the tags before transferring it? Uh, yes, you can. Um, so I'm guessing what you're thinking is like we have short one coming in and transferring it to short two. Um, in this case, probably we need to get a little bit creative. Um, DDA just put in V2, we or in, in V2.8, we have expressions. So at that point, it will be easier. Um, what the expressions do is that um, whenever we attach a tag here, um, we'll be able to use this e expressions pane, which I have an early version, so it's just showing this, um, to, to do some math. So we could say short two equals short one plus five or something. Um, but the, the way that you could also do it by getting creative is just by um, triggering this. So we can have this be um, a Boolean that maybe triggers every half second or something. And then in the meantime, you could be performing some JavaScript um, that does some math. Is it possible to post the questions and answers somewhere? Yes, uh, definitely. We can, we can post the questions and answers and maybe um, send these out uh, along with um, the recording and um, anything else. Uh, <clears throat> I was just checking about the uh, doing some uh, data conversion um, when using data transfer, and it's actually not available. That's why it's kind of grayed out. Um, so if you want to do any kind of math on uh, on the tag, on the source or destination tag, you have to do that probably in the PLC uh, prior to the actual conversion or the uh, data transfer. Okay. I wasn't sure if this was um, grayed out because it's, it's not ready yet in the beta, but yeah, yeah it's I, great I, out because of the uh, it's in uh, within the data transfer jobs. Uh, obviously, the expressions are available when you put a field, a numeric field on the page. Then you have you know the ability to add and customize have custom expressions also, uh, or select from a list. But uh, in the case of data transfer jobs, that's great out because we assume that the tag is already going to be. Um, if, if any kind of math needs to apply to, uh, to, to that tag, it's already been, been done. Um, okay, there's another question here, Joseph. Um, let me open up. Um, Joseph, I, I tried to open up your your mic, but it looks like okay. so you have you have this link. Okay. It looks like you don't have the audio on. You just want to type in your question. That is the original layout. That is the original layout. Okay. Okay. What all 
all you need to do is install at the end of the cable. I'll wait another minute or two here. Um, is attached. Especially if, uh, Joseph, if you want to add your question, if you had anything. Would using a scheduler on a trigger be the recommended way to create a flashing alarm light on the HMI? Um, yeah. So, flashing alarm light. Um, by this, I, I guess you don't mean alarms in the context of, of how I just set up. You just mean something that is going on and off. Um, I can do this real quick. I think it's more or less uh, the same thing that was in the alarms for the scheduler project. We put one here, um, Boolean 1. It's going to be on this light. And on my scheduler, um, I'll just make it a new one here. Or I'll use the same one. Yeah. So I'll do this every one second. Um, we could have a condition here, so maybe I'll set that up as well with Boolean 2. Um, but all this is going to do is toggle bit. So my action here, I want um, toggle bit. Tag name, we use Boolean 1, which is the same um, tag I put on that light. So we have toggle bit going to execute every one second. And it will execute um, if Boolean 2 is true. So let me put Boolean 2 on this button here. Oh, okay. Let me get the contain button. Okay. So when I first start this up, my light should not be blinking because um, the, the trigger is, is set to fall. If I see this true, then the light will start blinking. Uh, if you just want it to always blink, then you, you wouldn't have a, a trigger here. Um, That's correct. Okay. Uh, another question, is one second the smallest refresh rate available? And can J-Mobile handle data from the PLC that refreshes on the order of no Um One second is not the smallest refresh rate available. Go down to 100 milliseconds if you use the high resolution scheduler instead, um, which is a, a little bit different, but almost the same thing. So you you can do down to uh, 100 milliseconds. Can mobile data from the PLC that refreshes in the order of milliseconds? Uh, yes, it can. 